What's up everybody? How you doing today? I am David Long, here to do some live Q&A with you. Super excited about this. My first time doing it. I plan on doing it more in the future. I really want to start to get better at connecting with my audience and so that's why I'm trying to bring people to this group. That's why I'm trying to start a more deep conversation and I really want to get more into this opening up a conversation with you, having a more active philosophical practice. We'll say active, active philosophical practice with you. I'm so used to recording on camera that it's it's a lot different than than this live video situation. Like I want to be able to stop and think about what I want to say and then start over. That's what I usually do when I record at home, but there's not going to be any of that today. I'm also trying to minimize sounds in the background and stuff like that, but you know, this is live, so there's going to be some of that stuff. Also, check this out. Down here, I got my little puppy girl, Sophia, hanging out today with me. Sweet, cute little face. So, I mean, this is hectic. This is live. This is, this is what it's all about. We're hanging out together. I got a good amount of questions coming in when I was asking for them, and I wrote some of the good ones down here, and we're going to get into them. And if you have any more questions that you want to ask, go ahead and type them up and send them to me, and I'll look through some of them here as we go, and we'll engage with some of this stuff. And like I said, I'm going to be doing these live talks probably every couple weeks for a little while, and it's just going to start to be part of the routine. We're going to get this conversation going. It's going to be more us together and less me off working on stuff by myself, hopefully. Okay, so Brett Hendrick, he asks, he asks, he asks, he asks me, what makes you integral? That's a good question. So what makes a person integral? Well, when we talk about integral, usually it's a little bit confusing because there's integral the brand, there's integral the stage of development, there's integral the theory, there's the integral community. So what are we talking about? Well, the way I would judge if a person is at an integral altitude or not is see what kind of distinctions they can make. Are they making integral distinctions? Everybody has some ideas that are lower that they're still holding on to and everyone has ideas that are higher. And so there's this kind of inner struggle all the time between our lower ideas and our higher ideas, and that's development, right? So being integral doesn't mean that that struggle is over or that development is done. It just means that you're working on problems at a higher level. Almost see the stages of spiral dynamics in this kind of Hegelian way where it's like, this is the conversation of history. This is the human story, right? And all throughout time, people have been engaging in and participating in the unfolding of this story. And it's just almost like one conversation. One of the things you notice, especially like when you go into atheist Christian circles, they're having the same conversation. They've been having the same conversation for thousands of years. Even pre-Christianity, you have Socrates' Euthyphro dilemma and all this stuff where he's talking to Euthyphro and asking questions about what's the deal with the truth and the goodness of the gods even before we have Christianity. So this conversation is way old, and a lot of the talking points are way old. When you go into those spaces, those conversations are still going on. And at each level, or you could almost say a dialectic between the level, there's some kind of argument happening where they're grappling with each other. And at these integral stages of development, there is grappling happening up there as well. And we're talking about a whole other different set of things. How do we integrate in multiple perspectives? And what's the deal with translation versus transformation? And what's a skillful methodology? You know, what do we do once we're taking into account all of these factors and what's the best way to apply them? So to go back to the question, well, what makes a person integral or what makes me integral? Is that I take into account these five basic lenses of an aqual or integral perspective, which are quadrants, levels, lines, states, and types. And just this holistic view, this kind of an approach or methodology where you want to put all the ideas on the table and see what kind of overarching patterns start to present themselves. So even that kind of an approach to where you're weighing pros and cons and you're, and you're listening to everyone's perspective, that is an integral view. It's integrating diversity with discernment. Not a deconstruction, that's postmodernist, but a reconstruction of ideas envisioned logic we're dealing with ego and construct awareness so from this existentially awakened perspective of having ego and construct awareness now we're dealing with these problems and that's what i'm saying an integral perspective is based on integral theory including this integral stage and then you know maybe a part of the integral community but there are probably people who are integral who do not identify as integral but they're making integral distinctions so you know what's up jared 
Let's see. So let's go to the next question. I'll try not to be quite as long-winded on this next one. Shay asks, who is the most advanced and accurate integral thinker in integral theory? Uh, <laughs> no. It's a hard question to answer because, I mean, look at the definition that we just gave of what makes a person integral. Are they taking into account all these factors? How would we measure who the most advanced and accurate thinker is? Maybe somebody on... Um, the cutting edge of this conversation who's also capable of really getting in there in all of these kinds of different areas of the discussion and and navigating well making important distinctions it's hard to say but then there's also the problem of reach and impact you know you might have this really super advanced integral thinker who's able to make all the best distinctions but then you have someone like sam harris who doesn't claim to be integral who's making a lot of integral distinctions. Maybe not every integral distinction. He might still have areas where he struggles, like in terms of being able to value some transrational poetry. You know, he gets a little bit caught up in pre-trans fallacy number two. But a lot of the work that he's doing in the world does very much have this kind of integral flavor to it. And if he's out there doing all this great work and getting a huge audience, even if he doesn't claim it, even if he's not completely integral, maybe he is the best integralist because he's making the biggest impact with these ideas. So, you know, it, it really depends on how you're measuring who the best integralist is. Ken Wilber, you know, I'm critical of him, but this man has brought a lot to the table. He brought us integral theory. You know, a lot of people say that he's standing on the shoulders of, of giants, and of course he is, and of course he's working with a lot of the work that's been done by people before him. But the work that he has done is super valuable and impressive. So maybe Ken Wilber is the best integralist. I'll tell you my favorite integralist, who also is pre-integral, is Joseph Campbell. And probably a lot of people who know me and know my work, know that I'm a huge Joseph Campbell fan. Power of Myth is on Netflix. Hit that up. Go check that out. I think his work, at least for me, was really the setup for an integral view. His approach to comparative mythology or other people's religions is this integral approach, like I was saying before, of taking an overarching view, putting all the world's traditions on the table and seeing what kind of universal patterns start to present themselves. He's doing the integral approach to this kind of stuff implicitly, not explicitly. You know, it was before it was really fleshed out, but he really laid the foundation for me, and I think it's really important work. I highly suggest it. There are other people, too. Like, I think probably one of the best people in terms of integral evolutionary spirituality is Michael Dowd. He's probably one of my favorites in terms of people who I think are doing it right. See, this is more the distinction that I'm concerned with. Like, not even so much like who's the best, but like who is representing it skillfully with integrity and who's misrepresenting it. This is one of the major things that I'm concerned with. This is why I've made videos about integral integrity is because if we're going to be spreading these ideas, we want to really make sure that we're doing it right. This is also why I highly value Frank Visser, even though a lot of people are critical of him. And, you know, maybe some of those criticisms are valid to some extent. But this is a guy who is interested in testing and refining the theory and making sure it's right, making sure that it, it really stands up and it really holds true. And I have a lot of respect for that. I think that engaging with and refining this theory and pushing it at the cutting edge and really making sure that it stands up and proves itself, that's a super important part of this integral project. And it might be way more important than what's happening on integral life, where they have a lot of these kinds of friendly conversations. There's not a lot of friction and disagreement. And it's a lot of this, well, we all agree, it's integral confirms integral. And to some extent, more friction, more challenge, more debate, that's what pushes refinement. And I'd like to see more of that happen in our community. I said I was going to try to keep these answers more short, but you know I'm so long-winded. The reason why I can be really long-winded is in part because of what we were just talking about. Hold on a second. It looks like we might have a live question from Tony Garrett. Maybe I can let him pop up and ask, ask this question. Let's see if we can do that. It says it's adding him. We'll see what's going on. How you doing, Tony? Tony Garrett is one of my most beloved Patreons, and if we could get him to get on here for a second and say what's up and ask a question, that'd be great. It looks like it's thinking about it, so we'll see. We'll see what's going on with that. 
Let's see. No answer from the live. Okay, maybe he didn't he didn't mean to actually try to come on here. Anyways, uh, what's up, Tony? I love you, brother. Well, the reason I'm so long-winded, like I was saying, is because I really want to make sure I get it right. I really want to make sure that I say everything that there is to say about something. And if I feel like I left too much nuance, I want to get back in there and really qualify that stuff. I don't want to confuse people. I want to I want to do a good job. So I think maybe I overcompensate a little bit and say and say a lot. Let's see. Brendan asks, could humans evolve into the demiurge? And I think what he means by that, if, if you look up Demiurge, the definition is something like the being that desires to create the universe. Maybe in Buddhist kind of terms, it's that kind of initial spark of desire that gets the universe going. But what I think he's asking is something like, will humans ever grow up and be responsible, take responsibility for the creation and the maintenance of life on our planet? I, I think that's what he means. And I hope the answer to that is yes. I hope we can birth a new integral age where responsible and conscious leaders come together and create a new structure for us to be able to live together in a more peaceful, skillful, and sustainable kind of way. I really think that humans need to take responsibility. There is no God up there who's going to do it for us. It's not that the universe has a plan. I really think that people who are awakened need to live responsibly, need to live for the bigger picture. And it really is up to us to change history. It really is on us to be able to, to do this thing. The name of my last two albums are The Universe Project Part 1 and 2, in part based on the work of Andrew Cohen. What's up, Andrew? I don't know if you're watching this or not, but me and Andrew have talked a little bit. But I really resonate with this kind of bodhisattva type of Buddhist energy that's interested in being here, not just transcending and getting off this like stop the ride, I want off kind of childish attitude, but this like saying yes to life and being here 100% and being really invested in progress and evolution. That to me, you know, that's what integral spirituality is about, is about refinement at the cutting edge and taking it further. Which plays into this next question, what's more important, service and devotion to a cause to the greater good or enlightenment and waking up? And one of the main things that I've seen in and around the integral community and the new age kind of community in general is the idea that enlightenment is like the goal of life. <laughs> And enlightenment, depending on how you define it, is a realization of the always already. And in an absolute sense, if we're all God and we just don't realize it, how does realizing it make one any more or less God? <laughs> Right? So good is a relative distinction. If something is good at all, it has to be good for something to some kind of an end. So if enlightenment is a good life goal, it has to be good for something. Good to the end of getting to nothing. At that point, something like suicide is good, right? Kill yourself. You'll, you'll get your return to source like that. You want to stop the ride and get off. And to some extent, that's why some of this Buddhist philosophy can be really unhealthy and unhelpful is because a lot of it ends up being spiritual bypassing, which is the answer to another one of these questions. Another Brett asks, why do I detest mysticism? And I don't detest mysticism. If you've seen my vlog, philosophy is greater than mysticism or whatever, I'll post it down below later. Basically, I'm saying I'm a mystic. The part of mysticism that I like is this kind of practice, this spiritual practice that helps you to live in accord with reality, it helps you have this spiritual way of looking at reality, to see life as sacred, to see yourself as a part of this sacred unfolding, to appreciate this sacred process that we're all a part of. That is the best part of spiritual practice. It's this thing that gets you in touch with and accord with the absolute truth of unity and interconnectedness. That's super important. I wouldn't want to get rid of that. The parts that I don't like are these ideas like spirituality or mysticism gives one the ability to have magical personal superpowers or the ability to know things beyond logic and the intellect. Those things don't work. They don't hold up. They're outdated. So these are some of the issues that I have with mysticism, escapism, magical thinking, divisiveness, superstition. A lot of these things aren't integral because they want to be reductionist to a particular symbol set or a particular way of talking about things. And there's that major problem with bypassing and this unhealthy relationship with life and nature. So if your spirituality is about living this life, is about doing your best, is about living in accord with reality and living in harmony with each other, that's healthy good stuff. It's just when it gets superstitious and divisive and unreasonable that it becomes problematic. So let's see, what else is next? Okay, so the question about integral in academia. These same problems show up 
in terms of academia too. Too heavy of a focus on mysticism and trying to make these kinds of unfounded claims becomes a boundary from integral being really accepted in academia. I don't know if you've seen my What You Talking About Wilbur video on I Amness before the Big Bang, but this is a good example of how he has bad integration in terms of religion, the pre-trans confusion, but also how his over-appreciation of Buddhist mysticism and Buddhist mythology messes up his ability to skillfully integrate in science. And if academia is hanging out at a modern and postmodern altitude, the reasons that integral theory and Ken Wilber and the way that it's been done so far has really not resonated with academia has to do with the ways that it triggers both modern and postmodern values. Like the way that integral theory and Ken Wilber is basically advocating for some kind of creationist kind of reasoning when it comes to the story of evolution, that's kind of problematic. And also the problem in terms of postmodernism is this allergy to development, to stages of development, to some of the discernments that we want to apply to diversity. The fact that we want to say that some ideas are better than others, that some worldviews are better than others, that we're not just saying that it's all relative in a flat kind of buffet type of style, but we're saying that some ideas are better and more mature than others. And I think if you're running a business, like this, this coffee is sneaking up on me slowly here it comes if you're running a business a college is a business look at all the people that college and academia is letting pass because they don't want to really assert their authority and step on people's ideas i know a college professor who teaches biology who doesn't believe in evolution this is like a person teaching english who doesn't know how to read this is like a type of scientific illiteracy that's a travesty the fact that you could be a science biology professor and not believe in evolution so i think to some extent why it doesn't go down in academia is because to some extent integral theory is problematic and probably needs to be refined a bit to some extent there's too much postmodern relativism and too much wanting to be nice to people in academia and academia itself isn't really holding itself to that kind of high standards so there's a whole spectrum of problems going on there i'm really hoping that if we can fix some of the problems in the integration of science as well as have a more skillful joseph campbell style integration of mythology and we can get these things to really harmonize with each other. Academia shouldn't have as much of a problem with it. If you can really qualify it, if you can really test it and it stands up well, it should be good. Which is, again, why I value what Frank Visser brings to the table and his projects. Let's see, what else do I have? And again, I see a couple of people are watching. What's up? Hope y'all are doing well today. Feel free to post some questions down in the comments and I think they'll come up on the screen and I should be able to see them and answer them. Julian asks, does the process of science through continuous revision imply that skepticism about all knowledge and elevating the likelihood of pre-scientific claims that would verge on the impossible now seem philosophically sound. So I think what he's asking there is, we know that science is this kind of ever-refining process. Does the fact that scientific ideas are going to change in the future make them less reliable? And, and does it make pre-rational, maybe religious claims seem more viable because, hey, we don't know. And this is one of the kinds of things religious people will often point to. They'll go, well, science changes its mind all the time. So how do we know that science is, is right? Well, first of all, objective scientific claims are not the absolute truth of reality. It's important important to make that distinction right off the bat. Even our best scientific maps are maps. They are ways of talking about things. And I do highly value the Western Enlightenment project of trying to map everything out and figure out how all the parts relate to the whole. That's, that's a super important project. And there is a long history of science. But really, a lot of the things that science has figured out, they're not really being undermined. Most of the stuff that people who bring this up point to are breakthroughs that come because of science. They'd be like, well, we discovered germs. We didn't know the earth was flat. Like, oh, they point to all of these pre-scientific things as the way that science used to think or something like that. And so I, I feel like this is a very disingenuous, dishonest kind of argument when it comes up. So, and Sophia agrees. She's shaking her head. No, she's like, it's bullshit. I'm leaving the room. So in terms of science refining itself, I think it is learning a bunch of new things at the cutting edge, but it doesn't really change what's established already. It kind of just recontextualizes it and maybe adds more knowledge to what we already know. A fact is a fact is a fact. If you measure this cup and you say this cup has this kind of a circumference, that's a fact. Now, there's more things that you could discuss discover about this cup. You could test the temperature of the coffee. 
And that's more facts. Those more facts don't change the facts that we already have. They change our bigger picture theories. And that's great. But facts are facts. I love you guys. I'm so happy to be able to have this time with you and to be able to engage in this dialogue further. You know, a lot of times I talk about philosophy on my wall, but because it's in writing and also because I'm rushed and because often I'll try to respond to everybody a little bit. And so the responses can often seem very straight to the point, which can seem kind of cold. And I really like this video kind of format where you can see me answer these things face to face because I feel like there's probably a lot less potential for reading in mean or harsh kind of feelings or vibes or anything like that. Like I really do care about ideas, but in general, I'm probably not upset with you <laughs> or anything like that. Okay, Dave asks, is the reason an atheist and a lover of God don't agree because one views God from the upper left and the other views God from the upper right? Basically what he's saying here is mystics view God in a personal way because to some extent it's happening in their own consciousness and that's personal to them. And it's easy for scientists to reject God because God is not a logical fact that has evidence that exists in objective reality where you can measure it. Okay, so the problem with this is that it's not as simple as upper left and upper right kind of thing. There are stages of development, right? So there's pre-rational interpretations, there's rational interpretations, and there's transrational interpretations. And to some extent, I think Dave here is hinting at the transrational interpretation, talking about God as kind of this personal archetype of a higher or authentic self, and he's saying that scientists take God too literally. So these are different stages of development, but the scientists who take it literally are talking to pre-rational beliefs who do take this stuff literally. So when they're debunking it, they're doing so because people do believe it. And so that's still valuable work. We still do need to have this kind of critical and historical analysis. And also, in Integral, we talk about the one, two, three of God. This means God in first, second, and third person perspectives. So if you see God as something that's happening in the upper left quadrant, then you're only focused on God in first person. And that's problematic. And really, we do want to see God in the exterior quadrants as well, as well as the lower quadrants. So this is really important because too much of a focus on an upper left quadrant conception of God is a little bit too Buddhist reductionist. It's a little bit too interior quadrant reductionist. In Buddhism, we could say form is emptiness and emptiness is form. But still, you know, going back to what I was talking about, about the what you talking about, Wilbur, he does want to say that God is an upper left quadrant type of thing. You can check out my Wilbur video. Again, I'll post it down below. But if we look at it in the language of Christianity, there's this idea of the body of Christ and seeing Christ in your brother. One of my favorite biblical stories, even though it's kind of dark, is one of the parts where God is going to separate out the sheep from the goats or his people from the ones that he never knew. And it's something like, they're like, but Lord, why are you casting us out? We prayed a million prayers and we cast out demons in your name and we went to church every Sunday and we said all the magic words. And he's like, yeah, but when I needed a place to stay, you weren't there for me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was a stranger alone and you turned me away. If you don't see God in your brother, if you don't see Christ in your brother, if you don't live as a servant to the body of Christ, if you don't live as a vehicle of God and love in the world, then you don't know what it is to be a Christian. Get away from me. I never knew you. So if your idea of God is closing your eyes and bypassing reality and finding God as a personal archetype just within yourself, just God in first person, that is not a holistic perspective of God. As Michael Dowd says, if you think that you can worship God and trash the environment, you're out of touch with reality. We have to see God in first, second, and third person perspective. So yes, I am that I am. I am a manifestation of the universe in flux. I am this energy taken form, but so is everyone else. And I recognize God in you, which is why I'm here for you right now in service, in holy communion with this realization of at one mint, and I'm here for you. Like we're doing this, we're evolving together. I want to be a vehicle for love in the world because I care about other people and I care about the environment. So let's see, let me just talk about some of the projects I have coming up and then I'll go ahead and get off and we'll call it a day. Okay. Very soon I'm going to have a in-depth video where I talk about the pre-trans fallacy and how it relates to especially the conventional line, the ego or personal line, and the rational line, and the different versions of the fallacy that happen in each one of the lines. And maybe you'll get some bonus lines in there as well. That's some more intro integral material coming your way. I'm always wanting to do more of that, but I am super busy with some of this stuff. Let me just give you a taste of, of what I got going. So look, I got a green screen back here. I'm working on stuff. Over here, I got a, a bit of a project board going. 
you can't see this stuff because it's, it's backwards, I think. Yeah, so that's not really working, but I have a bunch of videos coming up. I'm working on editing this interview with Frank Visser right now. I got that going. I am working on this video about judgment, judging debunked. <laughs> judging people for judging people and whatnot. We got another integral review coming up about this new Michael Pollan book and psychedelics. Keep an eye out for that. I'm super excited about that. We also have some other integral reviews coming down the line. We're also gonna do an integral review of the pickup community, something Alyosha knows a little bit about. And so he's gonna school me about what some of that's about. We're gonna explore some of the issues around dating and the world that we live in today and relationships and polygamy and all that kind of stuff. Sophia's back and she wants to, to make sure that she says hi to you guys before we go. And she wants to let you know <laughs> she's super distracted. Let's see, what else? My album is coming out soon. I'm putting the finishing touches on that. I'm really happy with it. I think you guys are going to really like it more and more. I've been playing shows and doing that live and it's really changed the way that I write. Before when I was making albums, I wasn't really performing out. And so I was kind of making songs for me and for the integral community in the darkness of my room at night. And now when I'm making music, I'm thinking a little bit more about my audience and about performing. And I really think it's helped the content of my music a lot. So I'm excited to share that with you. I got a new vlog coming out hopefully soon. You know, it's really hard to do all these projects at once. I'm only one man. I take on way too much stuff. It's really difficult, but I really have a lot of ideas about things that I want to get going for you. Let's see, what else? Yeah, I'm starting to do these live philosophy videos. Hopefully I'll have interviews with Michael Dowd and with Joran Offelt who has this integral church book. I'm just kind of still looking through it and reading it a little bit now and trying to, to get some kind of perspective on what's going on with it. So that way, when I talk to him about it, I'll have a much better understanding of what's going on with it. Man, I have a lot of projects. It's crazy. I'm also doing like video production on the side now, trying to transition away from part-time stupid jobs to part-time video work. So I'm taking on a little bit of extra stuff, extra editing. Right now I'm working on editing a wedding and also editing some promotional material for some local EDM shows and stuff like that. So man, there is a ton on my plate and I'm doing everything I can to get a lot of this done and to bring you guys new cool stuff. If you want to help, oh my gosh, you guys support me on Patreon. Even just a couple bucks a month means a lot to me. Not only is the couple bucks a month super helpful, if every single one of my fans and my supporters and subscribers gave me just like a dollar or two dollars a month, I would be able to quit my job and just focus on doing this art for you full time. That's my goal. That's where I really want to be. So if you could contribute the amount of a cup of coffee a month, if what I do is worth that to you, man, that would mean so much to me. And it means so much to me when someone is willing to do that. Because to me, when a person supports me on Patreon, they're basically endorsing what I do. They're saying, David, I got your back. I want to help you. I want to see you make art full time. And I value it. And that's why I was saying earlier that I love that guy, <laughs> Tony Garrett, so much because He's been one of my longtime Patreons, my longtime supporters, and it just means so much to me. Even like a lot of my family and my close friends don't support me on Patreon. The people who don't even know me who support me, man, that, that just really touches my heart. It really makes me feel like I'm doing something good. And so if you're one of my Patreons, much love and respect. I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. We had a, a great talk. If you have any more questions and comments, let's keep the conversations going down in the comments below. This is just me trying to kick it off and get it started. And really, I just want to have a better conversation with you and to be able to include you guys more. I'd really like to be able to include more fan stuff, more of your guys' stuff in what I do. Like if you want to make memes or if I really want it to be more collaborative. So if you have some ideas for what I could do or really anything, anything that, that you can think that you want to contribute to what I got going, be it to the conversation or maybe a piece of music or a bit of art or some memes or something, hit me up, let me know. I want to, I want this to be a collaborative thing. Big up to my homie Alyosha, big up to Kevin, big up to my homie Kai, big up to Brendan. I really appreciate this idea that I got from him. He gave me the idea to go live and to try to have this conversation with you guys. And I think it's a great idea. So yeah, let me know what you think down below. I'm looking forward to our next talk. Peace.